Today I'd like to review um, a number of new insights into how the proteasome functions. Uh, but this is a special year for people of us in, in my lab. Uh, amongst other things, we're celebrating many anniversaries. Um, it was 40 years ago that um, when I still did experiments with my own hands, we were able to show that one role of intracellular protein breakdown was the selective elimination of misfolded proteins, or highly abnormal proteins. And the experience in E. coli led us also to find the first inclusions. In other words, uh, the ability of misfolded proteins to aggregate and form inclusions, which is so important in uh, thinking about neurodegenerative diseases, uh, such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. I'll return to these themes a little later. It's also uh, exactly 35 years ago, uh, as uh, was referred to by Jason, that we were able to show with a postdoc, Joe Etlinger, for the existence of a non-lysosomal pathway for protein breakdown. Um, the classic work of the Dube had shown and led to the general idea that the lysosome was the major, was the only site of protein breakdown in cells. We didn't think it could explain the misfolded elimination of misfolded proteins, and it certainly couldn't explain the phenomenon in bacteria, which don't have lysosomes. We focused on reticular sites because they didn't have lysosomes. And the fact that this degradative system was soluble meant it wasn't membrane enclosed, and it was requiring ATP. And this is a feature of the degradative pathway that I'm going to return to uh, in great depth later on. Finally, we think we understand some of these features and the selectivity of the process for misfolded proteins. Now, this system allowed uh, Hershko, Chikanova, and Rose to uh, discover the involvement of uh, ubiquitin, and then uh, Rex Steiner's group and our group was able to describe the 26S proteasome, this large complex uh, that degrades ubiquinated proteins. So now even uh, undergraduates um, learn about this pathway as the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, in which proteins are marked for degradation by the attachment of a chain of ubiquitins uh, in the multi-enzyme complex uh, involving ATP. And this was first discovered uh, as one of the supposed explanations for the energy requirement for protein breakdown. Uh, we weren't convinced and were able to show that there was subsequently another energy requiring step in which the ubiquinated proteins are disassembled and degraded to small peptides. This step about ubiquination, I can't underestimate its importance. But to talk about it here would be like bringing calls to Newcastle. I mean, there's just more expertise in the audience than I'd have to give. Or uh, uh, Philip's uh, review and cell will tell, tell you about the importance of this and the potential importance for drug development. So instead, I'd like to focus on the proteasome, this ATP-dependent proteolytic machine. It degrades the proteins and disassembles the ubiquitin chain, generating small peptides. 99% of which are returned to amino acids within a few seconds. And a number of cell peptidases catalyze this reaction. A small fraction get delivered to the cell surface in higher eukaryotes and are evolved in antigen presentation. This is an important part, aspect of the system. Uh, we've studied at length in collaboration with Ken Rock. And it's less appreciated by cell biologists and biochemists. So I just want to remind uh, you that just like the lysosome is used as an information system that allows the immune system to generate antibodies um, by reacting to fragments of proteins in the extracellular space, the immune system is screening intracellular space for abnormalities by looking at the fragments coming out of the proteasome and peptides 2 to 24 amino acids emerge. Some of them get taken up by the TAP transporter, trimmed by an enzyme that we call ERAP1, that uh, we described 10 years ago, that trims the peptides down to the 8 to 10 residues, peptides that are displayed on um, MHC class 1 molecules. And this is the way the immune system screens for viruses, for intracellular parasites. And it's important to note that gamma interferon, and also alpha and beta, 
change the proteasome, induce TAP, induce DREP, so you can activate the system in inflammatory states or in white cells to enhance uh, immune surveillance. That's an advertisement for a number of uh, area of the field. But let me go on to the real hero of our talk today. Um, and that's the 26S proteasome, shown here in, uh, in dramatic colors. The proteasome doesn't have these colors. We added that to uh, illustrate the different functional parts. And I'm building on the EM tomographs uh, developed beautifully by uh, Wolfgang Baumeister and colleagues in Munich. The core 20S proteasome, the yellow part, is where degradation occurs. And this is a hollow cylinder. I think that's an important point. Uh, just like the lysosomal enzymes are membrane enclosed, and you isolate the protease in a space that uh, protects the rest of cell proteins, the proteasome is hollow, and this very tight walled structure prevents the proteolytic sites from ever interacting with proteins in the cytosol. The only way they can get into this proteasome is if they attack uh, mainly with a ubiquitin chain, the proteins then bind, get modified by, in the, and mainly unfolded by an ATP-dependent reaction and translocated into the proteasome. The only way a polypeptide can get in is through a small gate at either end of the proteasome. And this is the gate um, to destruction, and we'll be talking about its importance a little later. Uh, now, looking at this structure, um, you already know more about the proteasome than we did um, 20 years ago. So when we decided that it would be really valuable to have inhibitors of the proteasome, uh, certainly we could think of many, many scientific um, questions one could ask. Um, and there was no mechanism there, as you have here, for chemists to interact with biologists to, uh, in fact, the word chemical biologist wasn't even invented then. Um, so we uh, decided to start a biotech company where we could focus on trying to develop inhibitors of the proteasome. Um, we couldn't at all interest venture capitalists in how useful such reagents would be. That was nothing that motivated them. But we were interested in a group of diseases that we knew there was too much protein breakdown. And a long-term interest in our lab is conditions that cause muscles to get smaller, the atrophy. In all these wasting conditions, we now know that there's an activation of the ubiquitin <coughs> proteasome pathway, say with denervation, and cancer patients that waste away, and AIDS or sepsis with renal failure, and perhaps in the aging. And this kind of condition affects millions of people, so we were able to convince some venture capitalists um, that this would be worth an effort in. We didn't tell them about our secret mission of getting scientific reagents. And we set out as our first goal to try getting inhibitors of the proteasome with the hope of down-regulating protein breakdown, maybe 50% uh, in these conditions. Now, how would you develop an inhibitor from the proteasome if you didn't know anything about its structure, at that time there were no, there was one E2, uh, one E3 that had been documented, one probably existed but not purified. And the only thing we knew about the proteasome is that it had three kinds of active sites. One was chymotrypsin-like in specificity, one was trypsin-like in specificity, and one we later showed was caspase-like. It degraded after acidic, basic, or hydrophobic residues. The subsequent X-ray diffraction by Hoover showed uh, in, um, that there were three kinds of active sites in each of the beta rings. The outer rings, the alpha, the central beta rings have each, in each of the beta rings, there's one of these uh, sites. By the way, I can, this is the first X-ray diffraction of the um, eukaryotic proteasome in the uh, mid-90s. And as you can see, there's no way for a polypeptide to enter. There's actually a gate, which was later became defined and will be talked about later. In any case, knowing these three active sites, we did not have million molecular weight, a million compound libraries to screen 
So we used something called uh, biochemical common sense, and we built substrates that looked like uh, these uh, <coughs> substrates. And then we built inhibitors that model them. This is a hydrophobic residue on a guy guy who, and instead of the cleavable fluorescent residue, we put an aldehyde group on it because we thought the proteasome was a serine or a cysteine protease, and aldehydes were good inhibitors of each. It turned out the proteasome was a different kind of enzyme. The proteasome was a threonine protease whose active site nucleophile was the hydroxyl group of the threonine. The first molecule that, of the series we made were peptide aldehydes with a phenoxy group because we knew that would help peptides get across membranes. And for the chemists in the audience, you'll see that this is just three leucines in a row with an aldehyde res, a tr transition state inhibitor of it turned out to be the three protease. Now this molecule, uh, MG132, has now been used in almost 4,000 scientific papers um, some of you I bet today were already addicted to its use. Um, and it's enabled scientists um, to achieve, to clarify many processes from immune recognition, as we've talked about, to inflammation, to um, diurnal rhythms, or uh, many steps in oncogenesis. It was the starting point for a drug development program. And Julian Adams, who you've heard about, was a medicinal chemist we recruited to lead the chemical effort. And he introduced the boronate group. And sure enough, that increased efficacy 50-fold in one step. It was specific for three, or relatively specific for three neat proteases. This is a covalent modifier made of eight by Hitta Plurgen and coworkers. And I show you here lactocystin, or its active form, beta-lacto. About this time, Stu Schreiber's lab, studying this anti-cancer agent, found out it interacted with the chymotrypsin-like site of the proteasome. But this big improvement of efficacy was the basis of a rapidly successful medicinal chemistry effort from um, Julian Adams and team. And they generated this molecule, uh, which is now called Velcade or Bortezomib. And it is now a $2 billion molecule, which 300,000 patients have been treated from. And a number of people uh, have had their life expectancy increasingly uh, elongated. The company, as uh, Jason uh, referred to, is called Myogenics, because we thought our first goal would be to build muscle. But then in a collaboration with Tom Antiotis, it became clear that these agents were blocking uh, activation of NF-kappa B. So the, the French capitalist thought it was important to change our name to proteasomes and transcription, or proscript, or PS341. And then no one thought this would be a drug, despite a lots of encouraging uh, success in the animals. <coughs> investment community was uh, tight at the time, so our investors decided it's time to give up on these molecules. We got sold to a company called Leukocyte, and we were phagocytized by Leukocyte, <laughs> and that in turn got phagocytized by Millennium. Um, in each case, the company's other drugs did not make any progress, and the team from Proscript obtained more and more evidence, and pretty soon this was the lead molecule uh, for Belcade's effort. The drugs were given to the National Cancer Institute, and they found in animals, as we had found in cells, that it was very good as both an anti-inflammatory agent and uh, as a um, anti-cancer agent. So it went into phase one trials in patients, where usually you just look at um, non-toxicity or avoiding toxicity. And the surprise was, in this group of cancer patients who volunteered because they were on death's door and had no alternative, there were two patients with multiple myeloma. And um, the kind of story that you've heard from uh, Jason is shown in this case. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells. 
And unlike other cancers, it's easy to monitor its progress because they secrete abnormal immunoglobulins. In fact, many of the effects of the disease is because the blood is saturated with IgA in this patient's case. This is a patient who resisted all known drugs, was really facing terminal stages, and PS341 treatment in the phase uh, one trial cleared the blood of this immunoglobulin, and the bone marrow got cleared of the um, bone marrow myeloma cells. Now this was really dramatic. Um, only about 5% patients showed this, but a second um, patient showed a clear response that no one had seen in this disease. So the phase two trials focused on myeloma. And it was taken over by Ken Anderson's team at the Dana-Farber. And they had myeloma cells from patients who had passed away because they resisted all drugs. And they showed dramatic killing by uh, myeloma, I, of myeloma cells with uh, the proteasome inhibitors. And sure enough, uh, quite unusually, this drug was approved after only phase two trials because the effects were dramatic, first as the final therapy, and now it's part of the combinations as the preferred therapy for the disease. It also works in um, mantle cell lymphoma. We do not know why it's not effective against solid tumors in humans. It's effective against quite a few solid tumor models in animals. But the main point is there are many trials ongoing, combination of ortezomib with other agents, and four other proteasome inhibitors are in human trials. It's likely that one or two also will be approved in the next year. Now the scientific question, which is quite obvious. Why is this cancer so sensitive? And why don't all cells get killed? As every exper expert um, consulted predicted. In fact, the typical cancer expert at the time had never heard of the proteasome. And if they had or looked it up, Wikipedia didn't exist then, but um, they would discover that this would be a bad target, they said, because uh, yeast acting a proteasome was a dead yeast. The truth of the matter is they were all wrong. This, this is not a very toxic agent compared to what oncologists usually give patients. The reason why the myeloma cells are so sensitive is these cells are especially dependent on NF kappa B for the production of IL-6, a growth factor, as well as to attach to the bone marrow that need VEGF and VCAM. And of course, in all cells, NF-kappa B is strongly anti-apoptotic, as many of you are real experts in this area. This is an attractive target for inflammation and cancer, but even the best NF-kappa B uh, inhibitors do not have the big effect. This is one effect. The second one, which is most dramatic, is they block the pathway of quality control in the ER. Secretory cells are often making mistakes in proteins. The proteins are pulled out of the ER and degraded in the proteasome. Um, this is a process which was discovered once the proteasome inhibitors were available. Many have studied it. It's particularly important in plasma cells because immunoglobulins are very hard molecules to synthesize. They have 25 cross bridges. And it's even worse in a myeloma cell because they are making abnormal immunoglobulins. So these cells are really always battling uh, unfolded proteins. And as soon as you put in a proteasome inhibitor and stop this uh, clearance system, then um, these folded proteins accumulate. Uh, cell looks on it on like uh, Naples in a garbage strike, um, covered with misfolded aggregates, which activates junk kinase in apoptosis. So there may be other mechanisms, but these two certainly make the cell uniquely sensitive. Normal plasma cells are also very sensitive, and several trials are trying to use this agent um, in a promising way against um, autoimmunity uh, in transplant patients or myasthenia to deplete young plasma cells. The other question is, why is this not much more toxic? And the answer, it turns out to be quite rather simple. 
all the major proteasome inhibitors that uh, many of you are studying are mainly inhibiting the chymotrypsin like site. We were shown, and we as Alexei Kislev, that if you inactivate this site in vitro, you actually only inhibit protein breakdown 40%. The other sites continue to degrade proteins more slowly. If you use high doses, not the ones used therapeutically, as cell biologists do, you actually also inhibit the caspase-like site. That's enough to block protein breakdown, actual breakdown of proteins, 60 or 70 or 80 percent. But these are not absolute inhibitors. They have secondary effects. They make the cell need ubiquity. But the main point is, at therapeutic doses, we calculate that the proteasome's capacity for degrading proteins is only reduced 20 to 30 percent. Now, most cells map that off, but these myeloma cells, it's enough to drive into apoptosis. Um, and that's uh, been, um, this, there are two take-home lessons, I think, aside from this being a good teaching example for uh, elementary <coughs> students. I think it nicely illustrates to the larger population the basic science and um, clinical advances really do go hand in hand. Uh, we would have never had the proteasome inhibitors if we couldn't be, convince people to invest in the topic. Um, and even though some of us get real credit for this, or even awards, um, the truth of the matter is none of us knew or thought about multiple myeloma. The patients taught us the efficacy. Um, we thought these would be great anti-inflammatory drugs, and they came close to going into humans because they're very potent against arthritis models. So the dramatic lesson in the clinic was that here is a target that we didn't know enough biology. ERAD was discovered with the proteasome inhibitors while these studies were going on. So you can learn a lot from patients. Um, many of you told me today. Uh, let me now switch to some newer things that have got us more excited. Um, for many years, we've been fixated on this energy requirement for, for protein breakdown for reasons that should be obvious to you. Traditionally, proteases did not require ATP, uh, in any case known, and it was clearly an indication that wasn't thermodynamically necessary, so it had to imply novel biochemistry. Uh, it did not involve kinases, um, as far as we knew, in any of the experiences. But every place from E. coli to isolated mitochondria to mammalian cells, protein breakdown was completely dependent on ATP, which led to all the biochemical investigations. We were able, in E. coli in the 80s, to study ATP-dependent proteases, a new kind of enzyme that we described, and I'll come back to later. The, to understand the energy requirement of the 26S proteasome, which here we show cut across, these are human proteasomes, here's the 20S part, we started studying in the, uh, late, in the early 90s the proteasomes from uh, archaea. Archaea, unlike other bacteria, have real proteasomes, although they don't have ubiquitin. And these structures were well studied by the Baumeister group. We were able to show that there was in archaea an ATPase complex when we looked for genes that were homologous to the ATPases in our proteasomes. In eukaryotes, there are six different ATPases, and we found one gene of that very closely related that we named PAN, proteasome activating nucleotides. It's a AAA family member, like P97 of the proteasomes, it's, and when we expressed it in E. coli, it formed a hexameric ATPase, and it activated the proteasome. In other words, it delivered proteins into the core of the proteasome so they could be degraded. Much of what I'm going to tell you about how the 26S works came from simpler studies in these structures. Now, this PN complex, when we were able with, uh, to get cryo-EM images, immediately looked like they could be superimposed on the core parts of the 26S proteasome. 
In eukaryotes, we have this additional lid that's homologous to the signal zone. And that colleagues, uh, my colleague Dan Finley, um, first noted, uh, well, others noted also. The main point is that in the proteasome in ATP has evolved in simpler prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, the additional subunits of the lid evolved um, to couple protein breakdown to ubiquination, to really give this process exquisite selectivity. So what is the ATPase doing? We now have four um, distinct functions. One role is that it allows, it's necessary for the tight binding of ubiquinated proteins. I won't talk about it, but the ubiquitin uh, chain um, binds first to receptors isolated by uh, in elegant studies, RPN10 and RPN13 um, in the proteasome. That is a rapidly reversible process. And Andy Peth in our lab showed a year ago that after that reversible binding, there's a commitment step, an ATP-dependent step, that makes the protein really tightly bound. Salt-resistant binding, um, UIM-resistant binding, ubiquitin-independent, in which the proteins somehow interact with the ATPase. This means that many substrates never get bound tightly uh, at this step. So the proteasome is rejecting a lot of ubiquinated proteins, which hadn't been appreciated until uh, these studies and studies of the amphibian uh, in a na our neighbor. Now, the critical step for degradation is the least understood one. There's an ATP-dependent unfolding that linearizes the polypeptide, which is necessary for it to get through an opening at either end. This is a small gated orifice. And the other role of ATP is to open the gate which allows the polypeptides to be translocated in where they're gradually destroyed. Now, we have a postdoc in the lab who likes animation more than doing experiments. <laughs> so we try keeping him busy. Uh, let me tell you a little about this dramatic gate opening reaction because we think we understand it and we think it's a really biological importance, a real biological importance. The X-ray diffraction of Roll and Hupo showed there was no way to get substrates into the proteasome. And by deleting the amino termini of the alpha subunits, they were able to show you could basically open the gate and allow substrates to enter. Um, we knew for many years that the proteasome was latent, touch of SDS, little heat, um, just mistreating it. Um, allows it to become much more active. And that's because of this gating mechanism. And work by uh, Finley's group and our group um, in some collaboration show that the gate opening is ATP dependent. But surprisingly, you don't need energy for this. Just a non-hydrolyzable ATP analog worked equally well. In fact, it froze the gate in the open position. Now, I should say, this is with PAN or the 19S complex on the proteasome. They're the where ATP binds. When the ATP is hybridized to ADP, the gate is quickly closed. So we think it's opening and closing it all the time. Um, in the cellular environment where potassium is hot, you strongly favor the closed gate, the low form, and we think this is security against inappropriate uh, undesirable degradation. Now, uh, what I'm going to tell you now is the work of David Smith, a talented former postdoc, who noticed that at the C termini of the ATP axis, there's a conserved hydrophobic tyrosine X motif that's found in archaeoproteasomes like PAN, where there are six identical subunits, or in R proteasomes, where three of the ATP axis have a hydrophobic tyrosine X motif. So the model was that this was important for the association and for gate opening. And we could give ATP or AMP, PMP, and drive gate opening and association. We could show that the HIPX motif was necessary by many approaches. 
adding a little carboxypeptidase, um, mutating the residues, or the best experiment is by taking the residues by themselves. Peptides from C. termini of pan, and when you added them to the proteasome, they opened the gate. In other words, the C. termini was really acting like keys in a lock. Now that's a very overused metaphor in biochemistry, but in this case, you really are opening a door, which we could measure by adding substrates. Let me show you just one of David's cute experiments. These are C terminal peptides. When they're very short, they don't bind tightly enough, but when they're six or longer, we can um, get gate opening and substrates enter and get cleat, which is the assay we use. If you mutate the hydrophobic residue to an alanine or the tyrosine to an alanine, you don't get this gate opening. The other residues aren't so important. We've now got this down to try peptides can open the gate. And we also were very sure where the peptides <coughs> acted. At the top of the proteasome, the original X-ray diffraction 10, 12 years earlier had shown little pockets. These are pockets formed by the neighboring alpha subunits. And work by Hill and then ourselves showed that these a critical lysine that was necessary for gate opening. If you mutated that lysine, you, the peptides and the pan could no longer open it. So we were sure that these peptides tickled the lysine 66 to cause gate opening. Uh, we happen to have as a neighbor, Li Fan Chang, a very talented uh, cryo EM investigator. And he was sure he could see this structure, if he did, took enough cryo EMs, and he subtracted this structure, and he came up with images like this. The yellow is the density from cryo EM. The green was the original X-ray diffraction from Huber and Balmeister. So this is the archaeal proteasome. And the red are the peptides that we add if they have a hip motif. If they're hot, if it wasn't there, you would see no binding. They bound just where we predicted. They opened the gate, and the extra peptides in solution came and bound to the active sites where peptides get cleaved. Um, by doing further studies, David and Yi Fan were able to get even higher quality images. And this is the way the gate <coughs> looks from the point of view of the ATPases. The N termini of the alpha subunits cross in the middle and they form a barrier so substrates can't enter. Um, and then if you add the peptides, open, take them away, close, open. Uh, we love these images, but uh, then again, for almost 30 years, we were trying to understand the ATP dependence. It was getting near atomic resolution. You may be asking whether you should believe this or not. Um, I was asking that because I didn't really understand all the mathematics involved in the image analysis. What convinced us is a little bit of docking uh, reaction in which we looked at the, in silico, the most stable form of the hydrophobic tyrosine X motif. And these are the interactions that one predicted, K66, K33, leucine 81. And if you mutated those, then it turned out that you couldn't get gate opening. And if you put the tyrosine in constitutively in the background, you get constitutive gate opening. So we think this is a very, uh, this is confirmatory. We are now actually in an effort to try getting small molecules that open the gate. The hope would be there that you might be able to help with the clearance, the degradation of inherently unfolded proteins like tau and uh, alpha-synuclein that are important in uh, disease pathogenesis. We'll see if that is really possible. I'm telling you about gating, aside from the story being cute. It's a little more complex than mammalian proteasomes. Only three of the ATPases do this six, not all six. The other three seem to be involved in tightening the 19S, 20S association. <coughs> But the reason I'm telling you this is because we think it's very important in disease and in regulation. And let me quickly 
tell you a couple stories uh, that we think are of general interest. This multi-step mechanism with <coughs> substrates bind and get ATP-dependent gate opening would predict that if you're going to have a disease process or you're going to have regulation, these ATPases in the gate opening could be a crucial step. And work by Tabrizi and John Collins in London, uh, her group showed that the prions that cause mad cow disease and bovine encephalitis seemed to be messing up with proteasome function. And they had evidence in a nice molecular cell paper a few years ago that the prions can activate the 26S proteasome. Um, this was an attractive model for many other neurodegenerative diseases where lots of people had suggested that aggregates were interfering with proteasome function. It was a surprise for the prions where there's a rapid degradation. In any case, in a little discussion of the paper in, in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, we suggested that gating would be a very uh, susceptible site for pathology. And uh, as soon as we published that, they called us from London, would I like to collaborate? And just to show you some of the experiments that are now done with the Tabrizi lab, they were published uh, recently. If this is the gate opening that you see in here, mammalian proteasomes by adding the C-terminal peptides. If you add the aggregated form of the prion or PRP scrapie of a pathogenic form that can be made in vitro, either of these will block gate opening dramatically by either of two assets. We don't think it just blocks the end. We think it binds the side of the 20S proteasome or the 26S proteasome and somehow it interferes with gate opening. Uh, if you use the alpha form of the prion, which is not pathogenic, you do not get any interference with proteasome uh, interaction. That's one of the main reasons for believing this contributes to pathology. The prions may be doing something else in addition, but this is certainly one toxic thing that they do. Uh, we're interested in this reaction is for obvious reasons. There are many other aggregation-related diseases in which it looks like beta amyloid interferes with proteasomes. And uh, we'd like to know if a similar mechanism contributes to those diseases, as many people have suggested, because in the inclusions associated with Parkinson's and ALS, you see both ubiquitin chains in proteasomes, uh, which we think may have this kind of defect. The other more important reason is that uh, Andy Peth and we published a couple of years ago that gating is actually activated in the 26S proteasomes by the binding of ubiquitin conjugates. This is, we think, a very important point. And I'm going to show you quickly two stories uh, that um, indicate that the proteasome isn't really turned on as an enzyme until ubiquitin conjugates bind. And the first assay we used was the assay for gate opening. We give the small fluorescent peptides, say to the 26S proteins, and if you add a ubiquinated protein, you get <coughs> gate opening. In other words, more than you get with ATP. So the proteasome seems to open its mouth wider um, when a ubiquitin conjugate binds. Plain ubiquitin chains do not do this in our hands. Plain proteins don't do this. Monoubiquinated proteins don't do this. Ubiquitin chains on a substrate <coughs> activate the proteasome. And then we got a surprise. I know we think an important surprise. Even though ubiquitin by itself didn't activate data, ubiquitin aldehyde did. And ubiquitin aldehyde, as many of you know, is a transition eight state inhibitor of the DOPS, the de ubiquinating enzymes. This is true in eukaryotes or in yeast, I mean high eukaryotes like us. And in yeast, there's only one ubiquitin aldehyde sensitive enzyme, UBP6, on the proteasome. This suggests that UBP6 was controlling gate opening. And sure enough, uh, building on the work of my colleague Dan Finley, 
we were able to show that this effect of ubiquitin aldehyde or ubiquitin conjugates was not seen in proteasomes from a UBP6 mutant. But if you got these proteasomes and added the pure wild-type enzyme to this, you could activate gate opening by ubiquitin aldehyde. So basically what we think these experiments prove is that ubiquitin conjugates, when they activate, when they interact with this dog, allosterically open the gate in the proteasome further than what ATP can do. And this doesn't require any digestion since ubiquitin aldehyde or inactive site mutants do the same thing. So we think the take home lesson, which I'm going to extend, basically is that a couple things. The proteasome is activated, and the first mechanism is by enhancing gate opening. This provides specificity for ubiquitin conjugates. The proteasome definitely is a better protease when the ubiquitin conjugate lies on it. USP14, UBP6, is the receptor for this regulatory step. The ubiquitin chains are binding elsewhere to RP10 and 13. But the real activation of the proteasome requires them moving over and interacting with UBP6, which has to interact with the ATPases. If you mutate the C-terminal of the ATPases, you don't see this response. So the first take-home lesson is that the proteasome is turned on. The second one is that this links to ubiquination and proteolysis. These are the two main functions of the proteasome, and they're talking to one another. Now, even stronger evidence for that comes from unpublished data. And I have to tell you one unpublished story in three minutes. <laughs> um, and the take-home lesson is very simple, that ubiquitin conjugates also activate the proteasome by stimulating ATP hydrolysis. Now, this is more interesting since ATP hydrolysis, we know, drives unfolding and drives a translocation. This goes back to experiments that we had done um, in the 1980s looking at bacterial enzymes. Um, we were trying to understand the ATP requirement in E. coli, and we described a whole series of ATP-dependent proteases, great complexes like MON, HUT, HSLU, that were ATP-dependent proteases. Some of you, I can see, weren't doing science or reading the literature in the 1980s. Um, in case you don't remember, this is how people looked in the 1980s. <laughs> and I'm referring to the work, well, this is George D. Martino, some of you know. And I'm referring to the work of Richard Volney and um, Joel Clemens. And what we, they showed is that bacterial ATP emesis are all substrate activated ATP emesis. This is quite interesting, because we found the same property for PM. In other words, you give them a substrate, and ATP hydrolysis goes faster. And these all have AAA ATPases that unfold and translocate. So we thought maybe the proteasome was also a substrate-activated ATPase. And in data that's now before the review is, Andy Peff showed that if you take a protein and ubiquinate it with a ubiquitin chain, you activate ATP hydrolysis. So that suddenly this enzyme is activated not just by gate opening, but it churns over ATP faster. That requires a ubiquitin chain, and it also requires a little unfolding on the protein. If you take DHFR, dihydrofolate reductase, you can activate ATP hydrolysis if it has only five ubiquitins on it. But if you add methotrexate, which is a tight inhibitor substrate, you block the unfolding, you make the <coughs> protein very tight, and this blocks the activation. So these experiments say there are two recognition domains. For a ubiquitin chain, you have to have a loose end on the protein. And since we can dissociate these things, we can do an experiment to prove this kind of recognition. If you take an unfolded protein like casein, it will not activate the proteasome's ATPase. 
you will do it from bacterial ATP inhibitors. If you add ubiquinaldehyde, which causes gate opening and binds to uh, USB 14 in, in mammalian cells, you do not activate ATP hydrolysis. But if you put in the two signals, in this case in trans, not on the same substrate, then you can mimic the activation of ATP-dependent uh, protein breakup. So all I'm saying, and I won't show you the data, is this system also depends on USP14 in mammalian cells, UBB6, and an unfolded domain. And we've tricked it here by putting them separately instead of linked. Now, what are we really saying? Well, let's pull it together um, in this sort of synthesis. The proteasome binds the ubiquitin chain on RPN10 and RPN13. And these are high affinity binding sites, nanomolocytes. But this can come off until you have an ATP dependent step in which the polypeptide gets linked to the ATPase. This is a commitment step, but things really only get going when the ubiquitin chain interacts with UBP6. At that point, when this active site is occupied and the ATPases have a polypeptide, then you get both gate opening and ATP hydrolysis more by the um, proteins, uh, the ATPases translocating the protein and unfolding. In fact, without going through the data, we can add ubiquinaldehyde and get casein to be degraded faster. So we can even fool the proteasome with this trans mechanism. I'm not sure if that is clear, but hopefully you'll see it in the, in the literature. So the main points here, I think, are a little surprising. One, that the um, system rejects a lot of ubiquinated proteins, deubiquinates them and drops them off. If there's no loose domain in the protein, say with the methotrexate example, proteins do not get tightly bound, do not activate the ATPase at all. They get deubiquinated <coughs> and rejected. So there's a lot of decision at the proteasome. And this fits exactly with the work of my colleague Dan Pingies, which some of you they have seen his exciting paper in Nature uh, last year, uh, saying, well, his and Randy King's were showing that if they inhibit UBP6 or USP14 with small molecules, they enhance protein breakdown. Now, that's counterintuitive to many analyses, but what the, their data says is that USP14 taking apart the ubiquitin chain is a timing device. The proteasome has a chance to degrade it. We're saying, while it's timing things, the gate is activated, ATP is turning over much faster. If that doesn't get you degraded, proteasome gives up on you. And it must be doing that a lot of the time, since you can enhance the breakdown, to say, alpha-synuclein by that kind of trick. And a major drug development effort is going on based on uh, that experiment. That, that was findings. Um, we're going to take two more minutes, if it's made for us for you, to summarize a story and end with a movie. Um, the, one of the questions about the parties was why you have six ATPs. In fact, why do all the AAA ATPs have six? And um, we've been wondering about this a long time. And David Smith, um, former postdoc, who's the beginning work, was able to show in a uh, paper that I can recommend, um, well, a little partial, but I recommend the paper, um, that these ATPases work as a team. Um, this is very different from, say, Bob Sauer's experiments on analogous ATPases that has them working stochastically. We're saying, based on some very simple biochemistry, that they work by a very specific mechanism that I'll tell you about if you read the paper, if you're interested. All we did is measure the binding of nucleotides. And there are six identical active sites in PAN. And we found that two bind with high affinity, two bind with low affinity, and two never bind.
So even though you have six sites, as soon as you bind the first two, it lowers the affinity for the next two and destroys the affinity for the other two. Now what this means is you have three kinds of binding sites, two with high affinity, two with low. And the experiments show that the enzyme works normally with two ATPs and two ADPs on it, and two empty. And this led to strong data in only one model could fit the data. That the ATPs bind across from each other on the proteasome, and the ADPs bind across each other. And as soon as these two hydrolyze an ATP, it knocks the ADP off, and the empty subunit binds the ATP, and these are now the ADP ones. And then next, when they hydrolyze, it knocks the ADP off here and promotes ATP binding to the empty subunits. So basically, this is, predicts a cyclic model in which two ATPs are being hydrolyzed at any moment, and it goes around a circle in a cyclic manner. And when you run a ubiquitin conjugate, it works even faster. Now, it's, this means there's big mechanical changes going on. And the latest cryo-EM for the Baumeister group has supported that. And as I mentioned, when you bind two ATPs, the C-term and I dock into the proteasome. And that says two dock at a time, and then next these, and next these. That's important because as some of you know, there was a symmetry mismatch problem. How you could have six ATPases interacting with seven pockets in the proteasome. This says two at a time and solves that problem. But it also says that the ATPase has got to be rocking back and forth on the proteasome, and they're moving up and down, and we think that's what drives unfolding and translocation. And this fits a number of people's models of how that pushing occurs. We have in our department a very unusual structural biologist, Janet Wasson, who after doing x-ray diffraction as a graduate student and as a postdoc of cryo-EM, she did an unusual thing for a scientist. She went to Hollywood to learn animation. And so she works, and if you want to collaborate, illustrating scientific ideas from the original data. This is in Mickey Mouse kind of animation. This builds on the cryo-EM, or the EM, and I mean, or the X-ray diffraction. And what she ended up with, now collaborating with Dean, uh, I mean, David Smith, is the following little movie which summarizes everything. This is the 19S binding to the proteasome, and these are the c termini hibix motifs binding. This is the ubiquitin chain binding. That activates ATPase, which wasn't known when she made the movie two years ago, and that drives the substrate through. So as long as the, this is occurring, there's a deubiquination occurring step by step, and this gives you a timing device. This movie, we would now have this process coinciding with most of the degradation. She had it ending earlier because it's a, a year old. But the peptides are going through. They're getting cut by the active sites, six of them here, and emerging at the other end, three to 25 residues uh, long. Um, it's a complex machine, and there's a lot of mobility that we have yet to understand. But the main take home pack points that are summarized here at the end, um, that ATP supports many reactions, ATP hydrolysis. One, the C-termini dock in the outer ring and function like keys in a lock to open the gated channel. And this is a critical step, obviously, if you want the proteins degraded. USP14 is a master regulator. It opens the gate when ubiquitin conjugates bind to the proteasome and interact with the dog. Somehow, the PRP scraping and perhaps other toxic aggregates block this gating mechanism. And we have yet to, one of the reasons I'm in Cambridge is to see if we can get the kinds of aggregates that are well-defined to test this model. And we also are very excited with this new finding that the binding to USP14 and having an unfolded domain on the protein 
activates ATP hydrolysis, and that drives unfolding and translocation. This is the critical step to really drive the processes. And it really means that the ubiquitin conjugates activate, which is a selectivity mechanism, and that deubiquination and proteolysis are linked. And this little motion picture at the end was to illustrate that this machine we think is a cyclical machine in which there's cooperative, coordinated cleavage of two ATPs at a time going around a circle. And how that works faster after you get rid of conjugate binding, we have no idea. The only thing I didn't tell you uh, was the important point that, in covering this quickly, if I didn't convince you, don't blame me. The people to blame are shown here. They're the guilty ones who generated all this uh, material you've had to listen to. David Smith did the beautiful work on HIBIX. Uh, Andrea Speth did the um, work on regulation by ubiquity and conjugates. And Henrika Besha um, worked out the single step affinity purification of proteasomes. He found Chang, who has his own lab at UCSF now, uh, worked on the prior OEM analysis and the structures you've heard about. And Hyung Tae Kim and Hugo Fraga um, are still in the lab working away. We've collaborated on many studies with Hyung Park and Dan Finley and on the uh, work from um, the prions with Sarah Cabrizi and their student, Pella Dereziotis. Thank you. Running a little bit late, maybe time for a couple of questions. First, I'd like to thank uh, Fred on a fabulous talk, uh, insightful into the serendipity of uh, drug discovery in the first session. And I think quite appropriate for this site, where I think most of our efforts are on, well, not our efforts, your efforts, on uh, the non derivative pathways and, and systems and the ubiquitin system. I think it's fantastic to be enlightened on what's going on in the protosome. Really, uh, most of it's now been solved by you, so we're probably working on the right area. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions, if anyone has any, a little bit late now, maybe we can have a couple, one, two or three questions. Satnam. Going back to something you mentioned at the beginning, that peptides released from the proteasome are involved in antigen, antigen presentation. So lots of non aberrant proteins are constitutively degraded by the proteasome, so it would actually be a problem if you had some recognition of of, of, of these proteins. So how about yeah. well, the, the question is um, the answer is not in anything I talk about. The answer is in how the immune system works. On MHC molecules, at any time there are peptides representing the normal constituents of your cells. All the time those are being represented and the circulating lymphocytes are checking out if they're okay. It's when an abnormal one comes, for example, a viral product or cancer product induced gene or the breakdown of a uh, cytosol toxin, a cytosol bacteria parasite. It's those foreign peptides which when a cytotoxic T cell sees, then it says this is a problem, destroy that cell. So, um, Everything we're saying, and, you know, it, um, you know, most of our work in that area, it's been collaboration with Ken uh, Rock, a serious cellular immunologist, um, basically says that what you see on the cell surface is a instant replay of what was going through the proteasomes in the cell 20 minutes earlier. What we don't know is if you look at all the fragments that a proteasome can generate and from a protein, it cuts stochastically, so you have hundreds of peptides coming from the immune casing. Why only one or two get presented, what an immunologist calls immunodominance? And with ovalbumin, you see synphagal on the cell surface. But many of those other peptides, all the algorithms from MHC would say they should be there too. But they're either broken down within the proteasome or they're broken down in the cytosol or they don't get transported as efficiently. And that's 
a very big question. How exactly the proteome, what emerges from the proteasome in the MHC class one proteins correspond? So, um, tell us sort of where we are with developing drugs against the trypsin like prote protease activity of the proteasome, or maybe the, the caspase like, and are they better, worse, or? Um, well, selective inhibitors of the trypsin-like site, uh, we've never worked on, but a former colleague at Dartmouth, um, Alexei Kisilev, has published about such inhibitors collaborating with the Dutch group. Uh, we've never thought they were very attractive because they're harder to get into cells. But his argument is the following. If you combine them with a specific inhibitor for the calotrypsin like cells, you get greater toxicity. And he has in vitro data for that. Um, I personally uh, avoided that trypsin like site because every enzyme involved in blood clotting and plasmolysis is trypsin like, and that didn't seem very um, worthwhile effort. I should be more specific. At higher concentrations, Velcade hits two sites. Epoxamycin hits at the concentrations some of you use, will hit the chymotrypsin and the trypsin like site. Uh, and of the drugs in the market, one says it's more specific, I mean, not in the market, they're, not, they're in clinical trials. One says, uh, the advantages of our molecule is it's more selective, it only hits the chymotrypsin. And another co a company working on a uh, molecule that looks a lot like lactocystin, but comes from an algae, they're saying we hit all sites, and that's a great advantage. I would suspect they're going to be have greater problems with toxicity, but we really don't know. And it may have nothing to do with the specificity against the lactocytes. What is very interesting, and in regard to your question, I'm going to restate the question a bit. These special forms of the proteasome that are in immune cells, and they're activated by gamma interferon or uh, type 1 interferon. And these are the so-called immunoproteasomes. And they make analogs of the chymotrypsin-like and the trypsin-like stuff. This is, this is actually related to your previous question. You cut proteins with these proteasomes differently. So you make more peptides that end to <coughs> hydrophobic or basic residues. And those bind specifically to MHC molecules. And you suppress in the immune cells or inflammation cleavages that are caspase like. Um, because those don't get presented in MHC. So you're more efficient in antigen presentation. But that also means you should have drug targets that specifically hit the proteasomes in immune tissue or in inflammatory states. And a uh, company, um, it's now, uh, it's called Proteolix, it's now been taken over by Onyx, has described such molecules and they're very anti-inflammatory. And they perhaps may be able to inhibit selectively other kinds of proteasomes. There's also a special form of proteasomes in the thymus, uh, thymoproteasomes they're called, um, and clearly people must be trying to make inhibitors of those. Uh, no one has inhibitors of the 19S, or the many reactions that we've talked about here, presumably would be either more selective or specific. And so there's many opportunities for drug development in this complex. I think maybe just two more. Um, yeah. I've just been following with that. So Valcane is it's one of the first drugs which has got boron in it. And my understanding was that that forms a very strong um, bond with the aspartic acid part that it should go through. Now, what does that mean for the kinetics? Because if it is a kind of covalent like bond, which is what I've been always made to believe that there is, it, you know, it effectively is um, suppressing the, you know, it is binding 
be reversed at the end of the sentence. So what is the kinetics like for Belcade? Because the implications were, once it sits there, you, you mentioned the toxicity is which you saw at 20%. Yeah. It should split there, stop there, and block it from coming through the yeah. Um There are a couple points in your question. Traditionally, medicinal chemists have not liked covalent inhibitors. Yeah. Um, my own impression is that's nonsense. Aspirin is a covalent inhibitor. And, um, but that's another debate. So one of the concerns was that boronate might be a slow off reaction. The real history of boronates was this is the first drug with a boronate, um, but they've been tried extensively by Merck as anti-asthma drugs and blocking tryptase and uh, amastase, and they got into trouble. So the medicinal chemist says it wasn't our fault, it was the boronate's fault. Um, because volunteers got into trouble for unknown reasons. So boronates had a negative impact, in fact, in our drug development, because a lot of people said these were doomed to problems. There's never been a problem of boronate toxicity for the boron. It is true that these react, they're slow off, they're not covalent. Um, they're slow in off rate, and that has an important implication. After you inject the drug, they're soaked up by all the proteasomes in the circulation, in the bone marrow quickly. The more slowly perfused tissues or inside of solid tumors, they never reach there because they're soaked up and aren't dissociating quickly. The new drug for millennium that's another boronin actually is a very weak binder and it has very much nicer pharmacokinetics. It binds the proteasomes and comes up quicker and diffuses into the central parts of tumors. So in fact, you can make a boronate that comes off quicker, and that may have advantages for some conditions and not others. The other two types of proteasome inhibitors that are in the clinic, the epoxomycin drug, which is called carfilzomib, and the lactocystinide drug, which is semitomycin or something, both of those are pseudo-substrates. Those are definitely covalent. And after you inhibit the proteasome, the recovery time is the time it takes to make new proteasomes, which is a day or two. Um, Belkay comes off sooner than that. But it's basically the topping on the proteasome is what induces apoptosis. The longer you inhibit the protein breakdown, the sooner those cells die. So if you inhibit it by 30% for six hours, you're as toxic almost if you inhibit by 15% for 15 hours or so. So there's some complex integration of how much junk you make or accumulate in the cell for how long to trigger toxicity. Maybe more than you wanted to put it in. So. I have a question about uh, UBP6 is P14. So yes, P14 is necessary to activate the proteasome, but vice versa, the proteasome is also necessary to activate USP14 by certain orders of magnitude. We'd like to understand how that works. Would, would you be able to comment on that? Sure. Um, I don't know if ever, anyone, did everyone get a question? It's, it's a question of which act, the function of USP14. USP14, as expressed in E. coli, has very little activity. And uh, Dan Finley's group showed that when you bind, um, that tremendously increases activity. This is not anything enzymatic. It's the structure of USP14 is very different when it's on the proteasome than what the X-ray diffraction images show. Um, exactly how USP14 activates the proteasome, Neither he nor we know. I don't know if anyone knows. Um, if you, in our hands, USP14 on the proteasome, compared to USP14, is a very minor activation. It's when you occupy the active site, either with a ubiquinated protein or ubiquin aldehyde, that then you activate gate opening and ATP hydrolysis. Now USB 14 is over here and the ATPases are over here. 
when the native sex reader person. So we think the USB 14 through some domain hits um, the RPN1, if you know the person for two interacts with the ATPase. But then none of that is really known. Now we know enough about the protein interactions to have a model. Exactly how this happens, or anything else we talked about, um, we have no idea. And in fact, there's none of the AAA ATP agents, so we know how a substrate activates them. And I think our model is the only model of how the ATP agents work at all. So, and that's what really remains to be proven. Uh, I wish I could answer your question. Uh, if I may indulge a final question to Fred. Um, just picking up off uh, Philip's point earlier about uh, small molecule drug discovery and your own points on uh, small molecule memetics of a uh, data opening system. And given the, the, the title of the lecture series being about drug discovery, I think it would be appropriate to finish with, your, with some speculations on the future of drug discovery on the system. Do uh, you think there's uh, more scope following on from your points on the uh, gate opening approach uh, targeting the proteasome? Thoughts on the, uh, on the ubiquitulation cascade itself and the dubs? Maybe a few little speculations to wrap up. Well, I, I have an, enough wisdom to try defending my own data, to try discussing data where a lot of you are more experts. I don't have that much gall or put spur uh, to try doing it. Let me say the following. Phelps written in a very nice review, putting all the enormous numbers of opportunities that this pathway offers for drug development. Um, a number of people have tried getting inhibitors of ubiquitin ligases. And one of the silly statements, which appears at meetings that you and I have both attended, is these enzymes work by protein-protein interactions, and we uh, chemists or medicinal chemists can't handle those protein-protein uh, interactions. I think that's silly because, as we, many of you know much better than I, many of the SCF complexes are recognized in very small phosphorylated domains, or HIF is being ubiquitated based on a small hydroxypromine domain. And so these are no different from other enzymes. And the real reason drug development probably hasn't worked uh, so far is that we don't understand how those enzymes work very well. And there's a lot of exciting developments of the kind we talked about today often that I think will open up many drug possibilities. And there's no reason to think that this kind of area is not easier than the kinases. Because you, you didn't, the real problem with the kinases is just the courage to realize that you can get specificity in the case of <coughs> one millimolar ATP. These enzymes don't have one millimolar of substrates, potential substrates hanging around. So I think there's lots of opportunity. And for the doves, there's no reason to think that uh, with 90 or so of them, many do not have exquisite specificity. And, um, the enzymology is a uh, cell cysteine protease. Those are pretty well understood enzymes, as far as I know. And uh, I think the most impressive effort is, again, my neighbors, Randy King and Dan Finney. Uh, they have gone after uh, USP14 and um, a very difficult enzyme, because you have to have it on the proteasome, as your question implied. They have um, also, in unpublished studies, they're going after UCH37, and they've achieved very impressive specificity, as have others. So I think the dogs are just waiting to um, be targeted. The proteasome may be a bit harder, and maybe for very different kinds of projects, uh, but it's been foolish to think about inhibitors because we haven't really known what the 19S is doing. I mean, we're just finding out that it's how it's working. Uh, so now we can talk about targeting either inhibitors or activators. We don't know what P97 is doing in this process. Um, I think people know that it's very important <coughs> in degradation of different proteins. It has very specific effects. 
there are shuttling factors that help ubiquitin in proteins get degraded. We don't know, um, to my knowledge, how those really work. And every single one of them is a drug opportunity. So I think the future is completely open. And it, the only thing that the proteasome inhibitors did is lower the barrier. They don't necessarily for, provide insights because uh, they're very different problems. Um, but the fact that they lower the barrier is, is great. Well, I think that's a fantastic point of which to end to uh, look at the great opportunity opening in the field for the future of drug discovery on the ubiquitin system. So let's conclude by thanking Fred for his uh, fantastic talk today and insights and for taking the time to meet so many of you. And I think also for his enormous uh, contributions recognized by many in the field uh, towards the field over the last 30, 40 years, I think we all have a lot to thank him for. Thanks very much, Fred.